a family member of a friend of mine is a sports psychologist. Do you know one? It's a growing field and it's finding connections in psychology and kinesiology. And it's an interesting world because it's the world of the mind connected to the life in the body. And I find it fascinating because of that integral holistic connection, but also because it sounds like such a cool job. You are, when you're good and when things go well, you're able to help an athlete uh, attend to their game. And somehow, like in the midst of all the odds, you help someone reach down deep and find the focus and that centered place in the middle of crowds and pressure. And the psychologist helps the athlete block out all the noise and just play their game and at a high level. And I remember, I wish they were here today, my daughters, because we've been watching a lot of basketball and we follow the Dallas team. And they're so surprised because when the opposite team is shooting a free throw, the whole crowd is going crazy behind the backboard and trying to make the shooter miss. And my daughters are like, how can they even get close to a basket with all that craziness going on? How do they even get it not to be a full miss? And I say, I do not know. Maybe that athlete has a good sports psychologist. And today is Super Bowl Sunday. I don't much care these days, but I'm rooting for the Rams because of Andy Anderson. No offense to Cincinnati faithful out there. And I think in today's gospel reading, there is a sports connection too, because Luke connects the story to these great crowds that have gathered to interact with Jesus. And it describes, and I think Luke is intentional in doing it. He says, a great multitude of people from anywhere you could imagine, all Judea, Jerusalem, the coast of Tyre and Sidon, they've come from everywhere. And they're there to hear Jesus and seek healing. They're reaching out to touch him because emanating from him is a powerful spirit. And what happens next is basically Luke's version of the Sermon on the Mount, right? But like I said, Luke is telling his version of the story intentionally. And Luke writes to a wide listening audience. Luke tells this story to have a big impact, freedom news for everybody who can hear. And you get this from the language. You can tell that this particular gospel writer is quite a cosmopolitan. He is about connections in the culture. He's writing to Romans and Greeks, anyone who might hear this story in the world. And it's evidenced by the fact that Luke and Matthew take this sermon moment from Jesus and the vital lessons that Jesus is teaching. And in Matthew, we know it's the mount. The words are coming down from the mountain, like it's just going to flow down from the top. And here in Luke 6, it's distinctly a level place. It's almost like Luke and Matthew got together and said, I'm going to teach it like this. And then the other one's like, I'm going to teach it like this. We'll see who gets the most readers. I don't know. Luke says, Jesus came down from the mountain to a very level place, and it's wide. And in that level place, all these people could gather around from all these other places and hear and receive the good news. Another difference is the kind of gospel that Luke writes, and you can tell by how he starts. When Luke begins the gospel, he addresses it to someone. Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. The someone is named Theophilus. Now, this could have been a person, but it's more likely that Luke is making a gesture to writing to someone with a Roman name, but the name means lover of God or friend of God, Theophilus. So it's like Luke is making a broad salutation to someone out there in the world saying, 
I am writing to lovers of God everywhere. Hear this story. Dear friends of God. It's like getting online and writing, dear Rams fan. You know, maybe you're writing to a Rams fan, or maybe you mean, hey, Rams fans everywhere, I have something to say to you. Luke's gospel is written to friends of God everywhere. So it's big and broad from the beginning. And it's centered on this good news for all the people who could hear it and need it, and you can find it in a level place. And here the crowds are. Another reason to connect this gospel to sports today is that Jesus is drawing these great crowds. He must be sunk deep into his craft here with his healing, his teaching, his feeding, his forgiving, because everyone's drawing in to be close to him. And remember back in Luke 4, Jesus stood up in the synagogue and said, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And here at this level place, it's happening again among them. These crowds are experiencing this day of redemption. But more than that, I think this teaching is focused on what he then gives to his disciples. It's like Jesus himself turns into the sports psychologist or the coach for the players. And Jesus gets them focused for their game. It says he's doing the healing and teaching, and then he turns to his disciples. Scholar N.T. Wright comments on this saying, Jesus approaches them like the competition is about to begin. It's no good lecturing them for hours now about how to play. What they need is three or four things to remember to do and three or four things to remember not to do. And we have the Beatitudes. Jesus preaching. Remember these things. And in a sense, he's turning them loose to say, you're going to go play from your heart and just remember these things as your instincts take over as you play. I like to play chess. Any chess players out there? Church chess club later? And we say this in chess too. I mean, games can go for four or six hours or longer, but they say that all that time spent at the board, sometimes your first thought of what to play might 90% be the best move. And then the rest of the time is spent debating whether that is true or not. And so you may study for days and weeks and openings and closings, and then when you get over the board, you just have to trust your instincts and in that moment, play what feels right. Well, these three or four things that Jesus is reminding the disciples of, it is a true and hard teaching. So I called Sarah Tony this week and said, how are you wrestling with this true and hard teaching? She's our seminarian up in Wenatchee, Washington. She's in the game because she's preaching these Sundays in February. So we shared about the readings and our sermons, and I wanted to quote her sermon today. She says, in the gospel today, Jesus is flipping the cultural narrative about who are the winners and losers and what constitutes winning in God's kingdom. The call of the gospel today comes in two parts. First, Jesus is abundant, fair, and loving to all on a level plane. Then he turns to his disciples and teaches them about power. Jesus is warning them about falling into the trap of siding with the power structures of the world while dismissing the dignity and humanity of the poor, the sick, and rejected. That's from Sarah Tony and her winning the game in Wenatchee, Washington. And from here to Wenatchee, from the mountains to the level plains, the Beatitudes are reminding us of this hard but true 
teaching of the kingdom of God. One of my favorite sermons I ever heard, I wish it was live, but it was just a video. It was Henry Nouwen, Catholic writer and contemplative. We've read many of his uh, devotionals through the years. In Advent and Lent, a lot of people turn his writing into devotionals. He gave this sermon on Jesus being tempted in the desert. And he said, those temptations to turn stones into bread or to throw yourself down, but, but not be hurt, and everyone will know how powerful you are. Henry Nouwen said, these are the three temptations that are part of all of our lives too. We are tempted to believe you are what you have. You are what people say about you, or you are what you do. And that Jesus found his true center by what happened before going to the desert and being tempted. Before that, he was baptized in the River Jordan, and he heard God say, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And that was his true identity. That was his true center. And that center and promise of God defeats the powers and principalities of temptation. In our tradition, we'd say it defeats sin, death, and the devil. So today, Jesus' coaching about blessedness and woes, it is also about our true center. Blessed are the poor. Blessed are those who weep. This can be interpreted as a reminder. You are not what you have not material things, not good, happy feelings all the time. There is a truer center. Blessed are you when hated. It can be interpreted, you are not what they say about you. There is a truer center. And blessed are the ones who are not attached to the ways of this world, but who cling to the love and promise of God at the center. The best promise of all, the reason we can trust this word is because this coach that calls us blessed has been in and lived through and embodied all of these moments. Poor, hungry, hated, weeping. From that elemental connection and in the power of love that overcomes all our temptations to hold on to anything else, we're made free, centered in love that has played and lost and won the game, if you can believe it, all of those things and then still plays the game alongside each of us, we are made free. So I don't know who's going to win the Super Bowl, but let's break our huddle today, still ready to remind each other of this true, blessed, centered way with Christ. Amen.